Thank you for purchasing and listening to My Blood Runs Black. This is the private one-hour poetry reading where I'll be reading different poems and excerpts of short stories and possibly short stories. The first one we're going to do is called Have a Seat, Depression, We Need to Talk, written August 21st of this year, 2016. It is in the form of a eight-line sonnet. Rejection stings like a hive of tarantula hawks. The rejection from poised, fierce stingers, from men drowning in worldly thoughts with ten toes pointing to the pulpit. I do not fit into distraught men's thoughts. Wait, wait, forget it. I'm back to loving life and honest behavior. I'm back. Leave my apprehension on the floor mat with the bent key and shriveled up recluse spiders. My reader, we have to move on at some point. And the July where thinness wavers in the wind is just the perfect time. The impenetrability can be penetrated and the impregnable can become pregnant. If you walk off with the ghost of holies and walk through the valley of the shadow of death, than the valley of the shadow of shade for cooling. I believe God will meet you at the end, and you'll be better for it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. This okay, one ladies and gentlemen. Going to be called. I'm going to be reading a short story. This one's going to be in my next upcoming book that's going to be dropping in three months, my fourth book. It's going to be called, or it is called, Grass, Smoke, and Wagon written February 3rd of this year. I came up with the idea for grass smoke and wagon in a dream. I had a dream earlier this year that for whatever reason, something in my head while dreaming was telling me I need to name the short story grass smoke and wagon. That's if you're thinking to yourself, well, uh, Sean, this doesn't make any sense. There you go. That's why. Okay, so here we go. This is a three-page short story. Yeah, I got the card. We pulled into the parking garage and tried slowly inching our way into a compact space. It didn't work. Oh, whoops, this isn't going to fit, James. What about the one behind us? He asked as I looked to his side out of the passenger seat window. James was mimicking me while I was on my radio show the other night. Hello, Nancy, am I drunk? Yeah, this is the Chuck Stew Show. I infused my stomach with two different kinds of liquor. We only do the show when me and the guest host are tipsy. This was our second time coming to the courthouse in four days, and we have to both make payments. So motorcycle pig pulled James over while I was in the car going out to pick up a cheap, unhealthy breakfast. I owe $500 for a school bus violation. Apparently, you can't make our way around the, you can't make your way around the kids if one of the city sheriffs are right behind you. He flashed his lights and I pulled to the side of the road on the private street. He asked why I was being pulled over. I was an in, it was an impulse decision. I thought about explaining to him earlier that day that I was taken off unemployment for no fucking reason, but figured he wouldn't have listened to my sob story. James, my brother, needs a 30-day pass. Mother did lend me 50 bucks, 40 to make my payment and 10 for gas. Two I could so I could get downtown. One of your best shows yet. I agreed. The podcast I've been hosting for the past seven months kept me grounded. A good sense of purpose, that's and being an 11-time billiard tournament winner. It's one of my good traits, but I can't make any money off of it unless I want my head bashed in with a pool cue. 
Which building is closer? I don't know. I'm not sure which street this is. We have to walk west. We have to go to two different buildings for the payments. My brother was giving me shit the other night about begging for money. This has become a regular thing since I quit my job at the roadside assistance call center. He was saying something about me getting my life together and how I need to stop asking for money. Oh, excuse me. I was so incredibly stressed out from driving back from Phoenix in a windstorm that I said fuck it and got off the chair I found in the dumpster a month ago and walked into my room. Forget about the fact that I've been giving him rides to work and back for the last week, which has been a pain in my ass, being that it's a call center 25 minutes away, and lumping on the embarrassments I felt when driving into the parking lot. It's the Red Cross, the same company that fired me, and the same place where I wrote 80% of the Circus of Pain. I'm just going to blame this problem on the government. If the cop didn't just pull over and take his damn license over speeding 10 over the limit just because his dumbass needed to make quota, we would have avoided this hassle. We both made our way to the building on North Stone Avenue next to the punk club turned hipster reformed church. I could see the building across the street through their stained glass large windows covered in graffiti by a thousand different tag artists. Hello sir, how are the kids? The security guard at the metal detector asked. One of them isn't starving, I said back. The other two ate each other. That's too bad, sir. The economy has been rough on all of us, even in 2016. A technological civilization with advanced technologies, yet we're still poor begging for scraps, I said as I, I said as me and James took our belts and jackets. I got a frog wearing sunglasses pin with other punk pins and the leather jacket. I don't see why they wouldn't let me through. Why do I have to take off my belt? Is it because you can hide a one inch vial of smallpox in the fabric? We walked through without a beep and made our way up to the second floor. I pressed the button to make a payment and the machine spit out a number at me. Okay, never mind. I thought I could just stick money in this thing, but looks like the courts are gonna make me wait again, fuckers. Glenn, you don't have any kids. I looked at James. I'm going to walk down to the court building and get that 30-day pass. All right, I'll meet you down there as soon as I get finished with this. He walked back down the stairs. I took a seat down at the front. A woman wearing a U of A cap with light Mexican skin sat next to me. She had to have been at least 18. It's all the same cronies waiting here with me with with me with kids with no gleam of hope life tied them to posts and whip serenity and whip the serenity out of them old wineskins ripping at the sides what kind of horrible mess was tucson i was lied to on several different occasions by different government agencies and now with no money in my pocket and to my name all i can do is beg for my parents money like some social obstruction and prey on them as the city preys on me. Finances broke or finances broken, wallet cold and empty with pictures of past kids, and all I have is the clothes on me worn millions of times, handed down in charity. Number A one oh seven walk to window number two. Wow, I've only been here a couple minutes. Well fuck it. Things are looking up. As I got up with my ticket, I noticed the girl with the U of A cap was looking at my wallet. As I pulled my driver's license out, I remembered that a cartoon character had its face on the back of that wallet. I don't need this bait anymore. I've got a dark-skinned woman I'm dedicated to. Page 3. What are you here for? The middle-aged woman asked. Dark, tan skin with a beat-up face. She must have been strapped to the same pole as these people in here were strapped to, just like me. Pay my ticket for the school bus. I didn't hurt any kids. Is that your paperwork? Yeah, I gave it to her. Take a swig here. She typed away without even looking at me once. I didn't care. 
as long as this is getting paid and I can have my license for another month, it's a solid. And would you like to make this payment? She pointed out a piece of paper where it said $40. Yes, ma'am. I gave her two 20s along with my license. She took the money. All right, sir, you are all set. Quick and painless. Thank you, ma'am. This man ain't getting arrested today. Walked down the stairway with the big smile across my face. Stuck the papers in my back pocket. And with my green army jacket, I stuck my pen in my side pocket. Then smiled at the security as I made my way out of that horrible place. James was nowhere to be seen, probably still waiting in line. I walked down the second steps outside the court building and slowly walked to the second court. Texted my brother that I'm outside and he said he went to the doors next to the guy on the hot dog cart. I waited around 40 minutes walking back and forth, watching the man down the way take people's credit cards for paying for parking payments. In and out, the people living Below the poverty line came from inside and walked inside, faces of stress and faces of relief. Some security guard who saw me from the window came out to ask me a couple of questions. I was walking back and forth asking my friends and girlfriend in the group chat on my phone if we should smoke bud and play with bugs at the next house party. Hey, you there, sir. Why are you walking back and forth like that? Asked the guard. I'm waiting for my brother. He's inside getting a 30-day pass. You can't get any pass for that long. We only serve a th out three-day passes for one dollar each. When do the lies with the government stop? I just looked at him and decided not to rebel by yelling at him. He's some piss-poor ant just trying to do his job and kill time. Another one with a guardian complex doing too much. He took out his tablet and started clicking buttons. Your brother's inside, huh? What are your names? The Brothers Garcia. He looked at me with confusion. In a way, he was like trying to search for something in the pigment of my face. Boy, you don't look Mexican. I don't look albino either. Just then, as an African fit woman was getting dropped off, I saw a man with one raised eyebrow, short with protruding white hair coming out of his green cap, walked past with a child in a wagon. The hemp smokers. They have the greatest of personalities. The security ass did a double take and decided to drop whatever charge he was going to give me for standing around and walked off in the direction of the man as the man pushed some kid. All right, finished and finally done for the love of God. James said as he pushed the red door covered in barbs, bars and wires. How was it, I asked. Some stupid fat black bitch has cut me in line. I was like, oh my god fucking trash. Just go ahead of me, I thought. And they kept asking rhetorical questions once they saw the clerk. Trailer park trash. I laughed. The woman also told me that there is no such thing as a 30-day pass. That motorcycle cock lied to me and didn't explain anything correctly. Progressive fucked me four times already. The false information from the brain-dead morons at their call center, but it's okay. I bought the three-day pass. Some things were finished downtown that day, but will most likely be coming back for one reason or another. The courts need to be paid and they take people who are scraping by. Most of us don't have enough to eat. Here and there on the news, someone goes postal in one of these government buildings, then everyone scratches their head um, collectively and wonders why. I don't know. Maybe if, maybe if the ones in power forced to make the millionaires and billionaires pay for most things, then the courts wouldn't have to wrap barbed wire around the windows. This next one is called, Y'all Have a Good Day, written June 10th, 2014. Slid the back door open and walked into the blinding heat. Heard the co-worker say, it's like walking into an oven. The masses are living in the fiery trash heaps and they couldn't be more right. 
crying with the air conditioner blasting is the only way to go. That and driving a long distance to take my hour lunch. Last night, I had a nice swim in the loneliness of the water. And who needs to be more alone? Sometimes there's nothing worse. Sometimes there's nothing better. I soaked up the heat in my bathtub like those detox tents. Watched videos while keeping my own life on the forefront. If I drop my cell phone in the tub, I'll have the same effect as if I dropped a toaster in. The voice of the video made me nervous. I heard a repeated ritual. Daruma sun sun fell down. Daruma san sun fell down. My hands shook with a heat gyration. Looked all around the tiles and watery landscape. Ricky called last night and we ended up talking for a while at the Jack in the Box parking lot. It was relaxing to talk about the contents of a weed grinder in the shape of a black poker chip rather than the thought of being followed by a demon with one eye while carrying a candle and salt in my pockets. The wedding is now officially canceled and I'm sitting at the desk with college papers in my hand trying to figure out if we all cease to exist when we die. Whatever. I paid $800 for a child to go to a Christian camp. Jesus owes me a soul. Hello, for side A, I'm going to be reading a very short, short story that is unfinished. So far, the name of the story is going to be called Isaiah in the Woods, but that is just a proxy name until I figure out what I really want to name this very short story. This is going to be going in my book two years from now if I decide to do another poems and short stories. So this is Isaiah in the Woods, um, unfinished, written on September, September 12th, 2016. My service to the rug, my solitude under the lamps. The swing of hours that are shrugged off like water droplets out of the shower. There is a woman who has all the demons bowing to the body, crushing men's dreams and smashing false confidence with a big hammer. I give nothing because I've got, because it's not a soul suck job. She doesn't soul suck, but gives life. I was sitting at the bar under the red glow, pushing my thumbs into the bar table after taking a swig of my SoCo and Coke. The enchantress came walking up to my bar stool. I had a lot of time, slipped a napkin I was writing the beginning of a short story on. She snagged it away from me before I got the chance to slip it into my front pocket. She read, the fruits of my berry toes guide me on the floor the music serenades me into a wonderful possession she placed the napkin against her chest and smiled to the ceiling glenn you've been coming to this place for such a long time you drink by yourself and make small talk with the bartender i watch you beat up that racist man a couple years back i was only doing what i thought was right i replied she held her hand out like fingers from the heaven sky. My soft nature has given me a chance with Arkansas's most beautiful barfly. Don't sell yourself short, Glenn. She's a Hispanic dime piece with all her teeth intact, my conscience says. Voluptuous lips with the black widow's hourglass figure. So beautiful that any kind that any king would have enslaved her. I grabbed her hand that drowned my sorrows in the blood of Jesus. I lift myself out off that bar stool and walked as she led me to the middle of the bar. Side of my child face bleeds black. 
This one is called One Hell of a Hammock There, Larry, written on August 11th, 2016. There was no time left. The dead summer has collapsed like a building on top of all of our ambitions. Collapsed with the head, collapsed with the dead people waiting for an interview. I've just turned 28 and this is what is expected. Waiting an hour and a half on my feet next to the front door to a grocery store for the middle to lower class. My old boss walked in looking for a position in produce. He quit just like what I tried to do. Last night the lights went out. Texted my brother about the bill that hasn't been paid in two months. Still living on motherfucking food stamps. Begging our father to pay for most of our bills. I looked to my right as I played with the cell phone for sale that my old boss came sliding next to me on his phone. This is bullshit, he said. Did you sign in at the front? I think around 25 people are ahead of me, all waiting for interviews. Yeah, my name is on that paper. One fucking guy doing the interviews. Man, fuck this, he said. I thought the same thing. Hard, sharp pains filled up my neck and back of my head like packed ice and small rocks. As if I'm the ground for the yard wanting the green grass. My brother and I lit candles of Santa Maria I bought at the Fry's on Speedway. And had to sit down where we, sta uh, where we stared at the walls and talked about the times I chopped wood for that old fireplace that now belongs to the bank. We couldn't have light in my ex's mother's place unless I chopped up and brought that wood in. As I grabbed some of those garbage cans in the kitchen, I opened the screen door, walked down that little walkway that one day will have our shadows burned in and then nothing but slow atoms, was my neighbor's porch. It had a brown hammock on it. Hello? This is Sean, side B, track number six of eight. I'm gonna be reading a very small short story that I wrote at work two days ago, September 20th, 2016. It is called Pinned Into the Praying Heart, Hands Folded, a short story. Here we go. I walked into a wash while coming off a street corner. My walk, I believe, to the cross is the worst it's ever been. <clears throat> I came back to what I used to come to, and it's a joyous memory. I stood still after jogging for a couple minutes, placed my hands together, and began to pray. Just then, even before getting the words out inside my head, Jesus Christ appeared in front of me. In spirit, with a white robe, short and stocky with short brown hair the son of God appeared in front of me he had the wounds of the cross in his hands and his feet I was shocked fell to my knees and worship with the palms to the ground at the Savior's feet my face buried in dirt and weeds rise my son he said I rose up and was completely in awe. I can't believe you're here, I said with a trembling voice. You've been calling out to me for a while now. Now I am here. Just like what the Bible says, he wasn't handsome. I believe I was more handsome than he, and he's the son of God. Supposed to look like a young Donald Trump. We began walking in the direction I was already headed in, the direction of a bent-up brown fence, with a star carved in and the symbol 666 marked in with a knife. These people have no idea that God, the God of the universe, is walking in between their houses. We walked up to the fence and Jesus looked at the symbol marked closely. 
He reached his palm out and wiped it with his thumb. The 666 mark disappeared. A, or actually like a fresh coat of paint came out of his thumb, blended into the fence perfectly. Jesus, I've got a couple questions. Shoot. When the father called me to be a pastor while taking practice bumps in that wrestling ring in Hayward, why did every Bible study I tried raising up fail? <clears throat> Even before I thought the question, he already knew what I was going to ask. He walked into the right, he walked to the right of the fence and I followed right behind. Why do you believe you think your followers left? Well, to be completely honest, Jesus, I thought it was my fault. I said with my voice trembling. I wasn't used to speaking to God in the flesh, so up close and personal before. <clears throat> Sean, you were correct some of the time, but I thought you not to rely on your own strength, taught you to rely on your own strength. Not in the instance with the group I gave you at the coffee house that's now closed down. You did everything you could and I gave you my strength. But free will and the ways of the devil's meddling can make situations pretty bleak. He took his iron snake staff and stuck it in the middle of the table you were sitting at. The faith was small with all of them, he said. So the devil ruins my chances. Ruined my chances. Yes, but no. My son, it was allowed by me. If you would have trusted in me, I would have met you halfway. It was diligence you lacked. I was very hurt by what he said. Put my pants or put my hands in my pockets and locked, uh, looked at the ground as we continued on. He knew what I was feeling. You work for me. The treasure in heaven has been handsomely built by you. I thought. I I told you this through scripture a couple of times. You go for the numbers attending when all I want is the work of your heart, he said. I know. It's just so hard to see that for a long period, I replied. Surround yourself with the brothers and sisters filled with the Holy Ghost. We walked to the end of the wash where the dirt overlapped the single street. The tall grass lapped against our legs with orange wasps collecting pollen. Once you get to the end of your silver cord, Sean, we will be proud of you no matter what, he said. We saw an explosion of colors from birds that flew out of the bushes connected with the gray street. Golden Fire in My Dreams by, by Sean C. Stuckey, written October 19th, 2014. The nights are becoming more and more lonesome. I think if the TV wasn't constantly on, I would go insane. Almost did six months ago, when I became so fed up with the idiot box and video games, that I quit for a week. Found myself burning old flowers I bought for my ex. Burned them up with her lighter on the porch. And then threw playing cards off the balcony. I thought of visions. Visions of myself setting my living room on fire and watching the possessions I bought with my dead aunt's money burn, melt, and crackle. Watch my nothing life transform into smoke while Presley meows and eats his cat food. I would sit and watch my ex yell at the cat while shaking with a fit of rage, spewing spit as if she was a dog on rabies. Meow, 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 shut up! I would hit the mute button and stare at the cat while she held onto the kitchen sink shaking violently as if on a roller coaster ride. 
while watching TV tonight, I think on that fire, the golden fire that reaches up quickly, like a hanged man grabbing upward to untie his feet before the lava tar takes his skin. My aunt is in Hades, and I became rich for two and a half years. The electric bill, the internet bill, rent. Would have gladly traded it all to hear God's sweet comfort, telling me gently of her being a part of the elect. Tonight I prayed for Jesus to stop my heart while watching the X-Files. Prayed that Jesus would take my life permanently for the fourth time. Yet I lay here in bed, 2.44 a.m., in a cleaned and well-pressed apartment. God always has other plans, and I don't blame him. Tonight, I would have turned on my fan and closed my eyes, but my ex took the fan. Last week, I took the gun that my father bought me for my birthday, unloaded, placed the barrel against my right temple, and pulled the trigger several times. Not tonight. Insomnia will have his way again. I'll put away the fantasies, put away the ritualistic black raven fire, and ignite and stays lit in my dreams. Sleep deeply and think of better things in a better place. Though church was wonderful this morning, they're feeding the homeless, and the old woman said on the pulpit that they need $30. I'll walk in next Sunday with the food prepared. What are your dreams? What's your dream? I want to open for Kendrick Lamar, read some poems, if he ever comes down to Tucson or Phoenix, or go on down over to the Bay if I ever get money to do it. Maybe read a couple poems and open him up just to break the crowd and then introduce him as he's coming on stage. That's what I want to do. Can you explain to us the new poem that you're writing right now? What are you working on right now? Well, to be honest, sadly right now, I'm, I'm working on... I actually just finished Road 5 of uh, 15. It's a series of poems I'm writing for my next book that's coming out in two months. And uh, it's it's kind of sad because it's about when a uh, when the uh, when a rose rose's petals um, turn to different colors in the seasons. I know it sounds corny as shit, but it's basically about how um, my relationship that I've had for the last ten months with a woman I'm very fond of is most likely coming to its end. So that's the, that's the most recent poem that I wrote. Do you feel your role as the poet is one that's supposed to help society? And what do you feel if we do venture into World War III, what is going to be your role as a poet? The role of a poet really isn't anything. It's not really anything, really. I'm just, bad things happen in life and I'm reacting to it. Just as, let's say, someone who drinks, someone who eats a lot of unhealthy food, pops Xanax or, you know, just different pain pills that they get prescribed from a crooked doctor. It's just like that. I mean, I believe my, I'm not a, I'm not a writer in that way. I just, I want, I ultimately need people to connect to it because then it's kind of like why I write it. But regardless, a poet it's not really anything. I'm just writing to vent. I'm reacting to negative things, negative energies in my life and just reacting to my anxiety disorder and the things that I, the mental problems I have because I don't want to be on anti-depressants. So, and when it comes to World War III, I mean, we don't really have, as a poet, I'm not really going to be having anything other than maybe possibly not having anything to eat. What is love? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not keep a record of the wrongs 
like what it says in that uh, Bible verse in the New Testament. That's what I feel the honest idea that should be in every dictionary should say. Love is not boastful. Love is not proud. I'm not sure what the verse is. You guys can look it up. But love is complicated. It's very, it's a very complicated thing because my mind is like a Rubik's cube. I see love from different angles and hate from different angles. When somebody doesn't understand the Bible or their walk as a Christian, it's because they're in a different place than I am, a part of many different people in a different congregation than other ones because there's a lot with different friends and influences. So you can agree, but you can't at the same time. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's a thing where we will never get along, but as long as you let those things go, like what Hosea did with Gomer, then and what Jesus does with us, then that's true love, I guess. I think that's my, that's my opinion, I guess. Can you recall the first thing you had published and how you feel about it now? I didn't realize my own potential even when putting out that first published chapbook because I felt that it was so bad but now I now see not in a narcissistic way but I feel I am the best writer in Tucson to look back in 2012 till now, it's really only going upward.